Good. Uh, my name is Grigori. Welcome at Secure Microservices Adoption Talk. Uh, this will be about security challenges and tricks we faced at adopting microservices, which I faced and multiple companies, which my colleagues at Credit Act faced adopting microservices together with me. Who have been particip participating in the previous talk about JSON Web Tokens in this room? Quite a lot. I have a good news for you guys. I won't be talking about JSON Web Tokens. So you might be learning something new within my talk. I have also good news for the people who are planning to attend the next speech about OS2. I won't be talking about OS2 as well. I will be talking about authentication and authorization. Yes, that's quite a good foundation for any security. And I will be talking in addition about other challenges you should consider when you're adopting distributed architecture in general and microservices approach in particular. So I work at Credit Tech. Uh, Credit Tech is a financial company which offers money to people. We are lending service. Our core feature is our scoring technology. We do it with machine learning and we aim to provide to our customer the best possible credit score. We develop in Scala and Node.js and I'm also a Scala developer with some Java background. So let's get started. I guess at MicroExchange we won't be reintroducing what microservices are about. In my examples, I will be using webshop domain because I guess fintech domain might be quite complicated for those people who are not very familiar with it. So instead of building solid monolithic webshop, we will be building a set of independent services so that our customers in the end of the journey should still see and feel a solid webshop. Let's start with some common characteristic of microservices which affect security the most. We will not cover all of them, but at least some that affect security. So services are distributed as independent components. Each component encapsulates some particular domain. For example, we have catalog service responsible for products available at our website together with prices. This is one domain. It's separated from payment service, which is responsible for being able to pay for our goods with credit card, with PayPal, whatever. These services might be developed by independent team, as we know. They probably are deployed independently. They might be developed in different countries, different companies. So they are quite independent everywhere in development and in runtime. The next characteristic is that services store data also separately. We don't want to have one big database. We prefer to store data of each service in a separate database. Of course, sometimes that might be not that strict and not true, so we might share storage at some point of time, especially in some transition period, for example, when we are splitting one service into several parts. So, but tendencies, each service using its own storage. And most likely we can use also different technologies, so-called polyglot persistence approach. The result of it, we have a set of independent isolated services. And together with isolation of services, we isolate security risk. Let's assume that we have SQL injection vulnerability in our catalog service, so catalog data can be affected, yes. But, for example, payment data where you might be storing some credit cards or sensitive tokens to authenticate to payment providers, they won't leak in SQL injection because of the isolation in services. The services are also not equal, we all know that, and they are not equal for security. So the bad guys who want to break your system will be first of all interested in something valuable. That could be data of your customers. Unfortunately, it's quite valuable in darknet. It could be money. So attacker will focus, for example, on some payment data. They will focus on uh, customer data, unfortunately. Of course, you might think that those services who are public, like catalog service, doesn't contain any confidential data. Our products are available to everyone, our prices are transparent. So you might think that it's not important to take care about security in catalog service. I will say this is not true because we still have two security concerns named integrity and availability. If someone can bring your service down, this is not good for the company. If someone is able to change prices of your services, that's also not good. But anyway, security risk of different services is different. So let's look on the bigger picture. With monolithic system, we have 
most likely one big component with one big database. If we have vulnerability in any part of the system, the whole data which is processed by our system is at risk. If you look on microservice system, we have microservices of different risks, so vulnerability in one component will not affect most likely data processed by other components. This is somehow very good for security in microservice system. But of course, there are challenges. So challenges are brought by distribution. So we have many moving parts. We have many interfaces available through the network. We use different technologies. We might be using different approaches in authentication and authorization. And these are common challenges for security I want to talk today about. So let's start from the most interesting for most of the engineers part called authentication authorization. If we call security, like most of the people immediately imagine authentication and authorization. So obviously, in microservices approach, it's different from monolithic systems. So our customers and users are communicating to multiple services instead of one. Our multiple services have to deal with cross-cutting concerns of the users. That's, of course, authentication authorization. That's also auditing needs. That could be calculating of some billing information. For example, if we have pay-as-you-go model, so we have to charge customer a fair amount of request, and we have to implement this functionality in all of our services. But that's not the only challenge. So another challenge is that we don't have just end users, right? They are very different. We have, for example, customers using our web shop. That's like most important audience for us. We have also employees of our company. That could be accounting department. That could be customer agents who are helping our customers to make purchases on our website. That might be delivery agencies and delivery guys who brought the products to the customers. You might be integrating with different partners. For example, you might resell your products on other website, or you might publish your website as a platform for selling goods for other people. So you have different roles, and our microservices have to deal with all of them. We know there is a solution when uh, we have to interact with end user requests, we have to deal with cross-cutting concerns, so we can employ API gateway pattern. So there will be a single entry point to our system, which will intercept all the requests and will do all the cross-cutting concerns. So that, of course, works. There are, of course, challenges with this approach. For example, the question will be who will be responsible for API gateway, who will be allowed to make changes in API gateway, can we give access, for example, for the domain teams, add new endpoints to API gateway directly. There will be, of course, questions how we want to deal with it? Do we want to use it as an out-of-the-box solution? Do we want to build something on our own? The improvement to this scheme could be so-called back and for front end pattern. So we can actually use not a single API gateway. We might be using several APIs depending on end and user type. So for example, we can optimize uh, our API for mobile clients. Uh, we might use different gateways for different types of end users. For example, API you provide to your partner is totally different from API you provide to your customers because service capabilities are different, SLAs are different. For example, API you provide for your internal employees, you might not need to maintain SLA of 24 hours per day, seven days per week. So this could be only work days for some roles. While for your customers and partners, you have to keep much higher SLA. So changes are different when we change and introduce new features for partners, our other parts are isolated. So splitting of the API gateway into several parts might be kind of a good idea. Let's finally talk about authentication and authorization. And here I like to start with trust boundaries concept. And the best analogy to trust boundaries I would use as an example is passport control. So trust boundary is a virtual boundary around some part of the system. By crossing that, our execution changed its trust. So we had untrusted requests coming from outside. At trust boundary, we have to do all the necessary checks to make this request trusted. So this is authentication first to determine who the customer is or who end user is. This is authorization. Is he allowed to do what he is wishing to do? Then it's input validation. 
And the same happens, for example, in passport control where you cross the border. So you bring your identity first, you show your ID. Here is my ID. So that it's possible to authenticate you. Then you probably are asked about purpose of your visit. So you may tell it and you will be authorized or not depending on different circumstances. So the same happens in distributed system. We have at least one big trust boundary around our system. So as soon as all the requests come into this trust boundary, we have to perform this three operation, authentication, authorization, and input validation. So the question how we should do it. And my opinion is that, of course, there is no silver bullet and single technology fit. And there is no, in my opinion, microservices fit scenario uh, in this particular architecture where you have back and forth front. And there might be use case fit. For example, you want to give an access to another service to the resources of your website on behalf of the users. For that scenario, all 2 spec is a good fit. If you are using some identity solution inside your company, for example, you might be storing your users in Active Directory domain. Uh, you might use Active Directory domain to deal with authentication of your employees. Uh, you might be implementing a login with social network for your customers. So then you might be sticking to OpenID Connect spec. So depending on your needs and depending on your use case, you can select different technologies for authentication and authorization. The interesting question is what happens next? So we have backend for frontends or API gateway, which receives all the incoming requests to our system. So what should happen next and how exactly we can implement authorization? And here is the solution I can propose you. So let backend for frontend have a knowledge about a particular end user type. So for example, we have specific backend for frontend responsible for integration with partners. So this component knows about all types of your partners. So all the gold, platinum, whatever you may call them. Let it do authorization on the high level, on resource level, so that this partner is allowed to access this service capability. Then we have to deal with so-called object level access control. So if this particular client is allowed to access this particular entity. And this is the part you can delegate to your so-called downstream microservices. And let's look on some examples. So let's assume we have customer and we have order entity. So as a customer, I want to be able to access my order and I want to be able to modify my order. And we don't want one customer to modify order for another customer. So we need to verify that this particular order belongs to customer. What we do here, uh, we know that access order is a trusted operation for customer, so we pass object level access control to our downstream order service. In order domain, there is no entity like role, permission, or user. Domain or order service operates only with order entity, and this entity has a field called customer ID. So order service have to match provided by backend for frontend after authentication step user ID with customer ID that assigned to this order. Let's look on another example. We have on other side delivery agent. This is a guy who will be delivering product to customer. And he also was, wants to be able to access his order. And his order is an order which is assigned to him as delivery agent. Once again, order service doesn't have any roles and permission. It operates with order entity. Order entity has a property named delivery agent ID. And order service have to match provided delivery. Uh, order ID with specified user ID. The question is how our downstream microservice can trust our backend for frontend which is providing this ID. So we are not using any tokens here, we are not using any signatures. Instead, we should establish trust. And baseline for trust is always first your network access control. So you have your system somehow isolated. It can be split into several uh, network security zones. This is always a baseline. But we come to the problem that, okay, if some bad guy was able to access your internal network, 
Now he can see all the open doors, I can call any service and do whatever he wants. And this might be too risky in many scenarios, so we have to establish more advanced trust between our services. So here we can revisit the trust boundary concept. And let's assume we have a scenario when our shopping cart want to finalize payment. Payment is very critical, we are working with money, so we want definitely here put a trust boundary. Well, for instance, shopping cart service also want to access catalog service to display information about the products in shopping cart. So we know that this information is public, uh, public risk is lower, so we might not be putting trust boundaries. Of course, we might implement a single uniform solution, like putting trust boundary around each service to implement automation and treat our services equally. That's also what we can do. Which technology can we use for trust between microservices? And one possible solution could be TLS client certificates. I guess all of you know that TLS is a default choice for transport level encryption and transport level security, but it can be also used for authentication purposes. So you might be using client certificates, not only service certificates, to authenticate your clients. The same as on boundary of the country, we provide our identity. Now our microservices provide their identity when talking to other services. So how exactly does it work and look like? Here is like the most expressive example which I found is from Nginx. So first step, we should enable client certificate authentication. Then we should say, okay, we will trust only the requests which were assigned by this specific certificate, which might be a certificate of some particular network zone or even a distant microservice. As soon as we verify that we can trust the certificate, we can trust information in this certificate. So we can extract client identifier from certificate and establish authentication so we have now client identity. So why should we use TLS client certificates and not, for example, different type of authentication like tokens, passwords, whatever? So main benefits here, like, you anyway, if you are considering making your internal system secure, you should consider transport level encryption. If you do authentication between services and you don't trust your transport, that might be not very reasonable. So you anyway want to have, for example, TLS certificates for your services to have HTTPS everywhere. So anyway, you need to deal with certificates. Why not to implement them once in a solid manner so that you can issue a short-lived certificate with a very short validity interval, you can rotate them frequently independently. Uh, and you can do this both for your service certificate and for your client certificate. Also, you can implement mutual authentication. In many scenarios, it's much more interesting and dangerous to whom you provide your data than like authentication concern. And this is what can be solved with mutual authentication. You can verify that service you are talking with is actually a trusted service you want to talk. We are relying on asymmetric security here, so we don't share in secrets. So certificates are relying on asymmetric cryptography. So we have private key, we have public certificate. Client doesn't have to share his private key with anyone, so this reduces some risks. We can implement everything on infrastructure level. So our middleware web service can deal with certificates. Uh, we can configure client in his configuration, and we will not write any single line of code responsible for authentication. That's possible. That might be not the optimal scenario for every use case, but it's doable. But then we have a risk like of misconfiguration. If you build something in application, most likely if it's not in configuration, we can bring application up, authentication is there, we can bring application down, but we cannot disable authentication. In case we do it via configuration, we, of course, can disable certificate validation, like in my Nginx example. And here what we can do, we can reduce this risk, we can do everything in an automated manner to reduce risk of human failure, we can also test that all the services are validating client certificates when anyone tries to connect to them. And we use, can use different certificate hierarchies. So if you have, for example, two completely isolated availability zone or two completely chains, you may use completely different certificates. If you know that uh, your backend for frontend is talking to your downstream microservices, downstream microservices talk to each other, but downstream microservices never talk to your backend for frontend. So you might have different trust chains for these two zones. 
Uh, there are, of course, concerns that dealing with certificate is not for free. I would agree with that, but I would not agree that this is something uh, that has a huge effort or it's impossible to deal with. Right now, we have so many solutions to help you dealing with that. For example, we have public certificate authority called Let's Encrypt. It's free and it has automation-friendly API. It has automation-friendly clients. Maybe that's not the best choice when we are talking about certificates for internal system, but for your public-facing domain, that will be a quite good choice for automation. We have a tool open source by Netflix, which is called Lemur, which is about to simplify different workflow scenarios inside your company. And for example, you need to give certificate to some person so that person can access some service. We have also HashiCorp Vault, and many of you already know this tool, which is used for storing secrets, but it can simplify your also issuing certificates and storing the certificates so that you don't have to still uh, store your certificates on hard drive of the machine. So let's look once again on the big picture. What do we have? So we have one big trust boundary around our system. We have different end users placing requests to our systems. So we have backend for frontend for different end user type. Every backend for frontend knows how what's the best method to authenticate my client. So most likely he will delegate authentication to some other services like single sign-on. Backend for frontend knows how to make authorization on resource level, on high level. Then there are downstream microservices responsible for some particular domain. They know all about their entities and what are access control rules for these entities. So what are the trade-offs and benefits for such, of such architecture? So first, we encapsulate knowledge about your particular end user in one particular component back and for front. And there is a dedicated team who knows all types of end user, all their roles and permissions, all their SLA and their needs. So we don't spread all the knowledge about our roles and users through the whole of the system because team which is responsible for orders should be knowledgeable about orders domain. They might not know all the gold, silver, platinum partners your company deal with. They should concentrate on orders domain. Another benefit is that our downstream microservices now become responsible only for establishing trust with other microservices. They don't have to deal with establishing trust with uh, end users. So they become, in this sense, more usable. So you, for example, can make your service open source. It will not depend on your all types of roles and permissions that you have in your system. Or you might easier bring on board some third-party component out of the box software to specify and to satisfy needs of your particular problem and domain. So we are done with authentication and authentication brings some challenges. Like because we have authentication, we have many secrets. And the next problem we have in microservice system, everyone start talking to everyone. Every service start having a lot of secrets a lot of database passwords, and the question is how to deal with such amount of secret data. I guess I'm already the third guy within this conference who is recognizing 12-factor app, so who still don't know, this is a set of recommendations from Heroku team, how to build your applications, which will be executed as software as a service. One of their recommendations is about configuration. And let's say secrets somehow belong to configuration. And they said you should put your configuration into environment and you should never store your configuration as a source code. It's especially bad idea to store your secrets as a source code. And the one good idea they provide, like if you can make at any time your code as open source, let's forget for a moment about patenting issue, about business value of your code, let's let make it open source, then probably we don't have any secrets inside this code. If you cannot do this, like most likely you have some secrets in it. So the question, if you don't want to have the secrets in code, the next step would be, Let's make sure they will never happen and there will be no secret in your source code. Let's put some automation checks. Like there is a utility called Git Secrets by AWS Labs, so it can be implemented as a commit hook. 
so that when, whenever you try to commit your changes into Git repository, this utility will check automatically that you don't have secrets in your file changes, you don't have secrets in your commits messages, and you don't have secrets in your history. You might integrate this tool as well with your continuous integration pipeline. Of course, this tool is not some machine learning magic. It works based on regexp, and by default, they try to find AWS secrets, but you can adjust regex to your needs and try to find more secrets. So the question is, if you cannot store them in source code, where should they store it? And for every industry problem, probably there is a solution already. And solution where to store secret is secret management software. So why should one use secret management software? Why cannot use a database or configuration management? So the main reason not all database or configuration management tool has necessary features to store secrets properly. And these features are, everyone knows that storing passwords in plain text is a bad idea. So we should then store hashed as or encrypted. And we should transfer them encrypted as well. You might want to audit not only changes to your secrets, but all kinds of access. This will help you a lot if you are suspecting some fraud and you want to investigate some fraud scenarios. You want also to change secrets. Like we all know it's a good idea to change your password, so we can do that automatically. And why should we do that? For example, a bad guy has password from your database, but he doesn't have access to the network where database is. So he will try to put all of his effort, effort into bringing your network to get finally to the database. So what we can do, we can already rotate secrets automatically so that he has very short window of time when he knows the real password and he can break your system. And we can have a very, very fine-grained permissions. What does it mean? For example, we have a password from database. Who should know this password? So ideally, it's only single subject should know this password. It's your application. No human should ever see this password. Who should change this password? So ideally, this is only a process who is responsible for your secrets rotation. Of course, you will have some admin roles, but for example, you can separate admin of secret storage from admins who administrate uh, final infrastructure, so that those who has admin access to the secret management software has no admin access to other assets. So what actually secrets management software are currently available and I found them interesting. So there are four, two solutions uh, which are problem context agnostic, uh, they are called Conjure and HashiCorp Vault. You can store your secret there. They are working as a REST API. They store all your secrets encrypted and they satisfy all the features you saw before. If you are using Docker containers and you have some container orchestration tool, I would say almost all of them contain some way to properly store your secrets. So recent release of Docker 1.13 brought secret management API. Kubernetes has secret management quite a long time, it's also present in the COS. You might be thinking like, why do I need such a complicated solution called secret management? I might just implement some kind of encryption on top of my MongoDB or on top of my console. Like, these solutions already exist on GitHub as well. There are many more, more simpler secrets managers, and you can find them in this repository called CryptoMinotSuck. It's repository maintained by Steve Weiss. He is collecting different cryptographic solutions which are good according to his opinion. So there is a section called secret management software. You can find many more simpler solutions there. The next problem we faced with microservices. It's vulnerable dependencies. So by dependencies we mean Dependencies to your third-party libraries, to your frameworks that you use, to your execution environment that you use. With monolithic applications, so picture was quite simple. For example, we are using Java, we are using our favorite Spring framework. Uh, we keep ourselves up to date with all the changes in this framework. We want to update the latest version as soon as possible. We participate in different mail groups discussion. We follow tags on Stack Overflow. If some vulnerability will be appear, we might get know about it quickly from our mail lists or with updates of our library. 
What can happen with microservices? Of course, you can experiment with different technologies, and that's quite a reasonable idea. For example, you may try a new GVM language, and then you either stick to it and forget about Java, or you forget about this GVM language, you might finally implement something on Go, and sometimes this experiment succeeds, sometimes not. And we are not following, for example, community and changes of the frameworks, which we are not interested in anymore, so there is a solid piece of software which is working, you might question yourself why I should update anything. And here might be the case that in your third-party dependency there is some known vulnerability. What known vulnerability means? So here is an example of Pivotal company, which stands behind Cloudflare and which is responsible for Spring Framework in Java. So they have a dedicated security page where they publish information about the found vulnerabilities in their libraries and products, which is a very good idea. So responsible disclosure of vulnerabilities is definitely good. So each vulnerability has assigned ID from national vulnerability database. So there are more databases like this. For example, Debian or Red Hat, they provide such information as well. So what you can do, you can change your dependencies automatically. You can automatically scan that your dependencies do not have known vulnerabilities. And there is a solution called SourceClear. It's available as software as a service. It can help you to scan vulnerabilities in dependencies in uh, many, for many different languages and for many different dependency management tools. So you can use, in many cases, one single tool to scan all your dependencies. You might be using, of course, different other tools. For example, in JVM world, for Maven, we have Maven dependency check. For SBT, we have uh, SBT dependency check. For Node.js, we have uh, NSP, Node Security Project, to check your dependencies. And the question is when you should check for your dependencies. And I would say one logical solution whenever you make changes, but uh, this approach has some weaknesses because vulnerability appears in your dependency not when you introduce it. You may introduce it, everything is fine, but then uh, vulnerability was found. So in an ideal world, you should scan for vulnerabilities in your dependencies continuously in a non-stop way. As soon as vulnerability found, you rise a trigger, your security analyst look into it, risk is determined, and you patch sooner or later. The same you can do actually with Docker containers. And I was in doubt, should I put here also logo of Linux Alpine, which is very minimalistic Linux distribution, which can show, uh, which can minimize vulnerabilities and dependencies of your Docker images. So there is a similar solution called Clare. It can store your, or it can scan your images layer by layer and find open vulnerabilities there. And if we are already talking about Docker security, I would mention the second problem. So many security best practices cannot be enabled in Docker by default because Docker by himself doesn't know what, for example, your trusted registry is. Can you trust registry with this specific domain? There are a lot of requirements and recommendations. For example, you should include user into your single Docker file, not run your application as root. There are many, many recommendations, and there is a standard from Center of Internet Technology. They have ma many different standards for different technology. For example, they have standard for Docker, they have standard for Hadoop ecosystem, they have standard for Debian, if I remember correctly. Okay, so, and there is a script available in official Docker repository which can check these requirements automatically. You can adjust the script to your needs, you can map may put additional checks, you may disable checks which you feel are not relevant in your environment, but that's definitely a good way to check that your container environment is safe. Okay, so we covered pretty much a lot. We covered authentication, we covered why microservices could be worse or better for security. We covered a bit secret management problem and vulnerable dependencies problem. So what are my conclusions. So yeah, microservices architecture is a late component and this really reduces risk. You should use this concern when you model your system. You first of all, of course, look into your domains to isolate bounded contexts. Then you might look into performance, like how many hops we have. Then we can look on availability. If services with critical, very, very high availability we need are uh, 
less dependent on other services, but then should be look also on security. Like if our services which process sensitive data are isolated from those who don't process sensitive data. Of course, many moving parts do not improve security, so many technologies and distribution introduce new risk and we have to deal with that. You have to find a proper way for your authentication and authorization strategy. And I don't propose you just simply reuse my strategy. So if you were watching a previous talk about uh, JSON Web Token, this schema is valid as well. So if you have much simpler distribution between users, you have just, for example, consumer and admin, you have a few microservices, single UI, you might not need API gateway backend for front end and TLS certificates. You might do it with JSON Web Tokens. But what you need to do, you need to find a proper strategy to do authentication and authorization. With growth of your services grows also risks such as secret management and risk of vulnerabilities. And to really mitigate those risks, what is really crucial is automation. There is a nice article by Martin Fowler, which is called Microservice Prerequisites. You all probably know it. It says, like, before adopting microservices, think about your monitoring first, about your continuous integration process, and if you have DevOps culture. I would add to this list also security automation. If, you are, if security in your system is really a concern, you should think also about automating your security concerns, such as secret management and vulnerability management. And the last recommendation from me for today would be don't forget about other security practices. So the practices I described today, they are more or less specific to microservices architecture, but there are already a lot of other practices which were available for a long time before microservice hype started. So you can do threat modeling, you can think about your attackers and potential threats before you write code. When you write code, you can follow best recommendations how to avoid vulnerabilities such as SQL injections or cross-site scripting. You should test your security as any other functionality. You might do penetration testing from testing your system outside without any system knowledge. You should be prepared for incidents, of course, because incidents, there's something that can happen. And it's very important to deliver right message to your customer, to be prepared, for example, to change all your secrets and know what to do. And there are a lot of more other valid security recommendations you should use and know about to make your system secure. That's all from my side. <laughs> Let's go with questions. Yeah, thank you for your talk. Um, I wonder how do you use the secret management software in cooperation with microservices? So have you extracted all the secrets to this server and you do not store any secrets in the microservices themselves? And yeah. then how do microservices authenticate by the server? Okay, that's a very good question and this is the most challenging question to solve when you integrate with the secret management. So what we do, uh, we fetch all the secrets by our deployment process and we provide the secrets as environment variables to our process, which is application. So we don't store any secret on hard drive, we provide it to application directly. And the hardest question to solve in this task is like, okay, now we have uh, storage with secrets, but how we should authenticate to storage with secrets? We have one additional secret. And the best solution we found would be usage of one-time token. So you give one-time token to your application, it authenticates once, it fetches all the secrets, and the token is not valid anymore. Hey, uh, I just want to know how you test this, um, the whole environment if you're using the TLS certificates, because this is, seems to be quite complex. Uh, it's not that complex. It's actually much easier to deal with client certificate that you might imagine. So, for example, if you want to access your REST API from your browser, you can add your private key to the trust chain of your operating system, and whenever you connect to this asset 
which is protected by client certificate, your browser will just ask which private key I should use. You say this one, okay. If it's password protected, you might enter your password, but it's easy. And every mature HTTP client supports also client certificates. So that, for example, Postman supported, it uses Chrome, uh, just simple curl command line also support the client certificate. So all the tools are there. Just mean uh, when you you don't uh, like uh, secure the whole um, like any um, service, but you secure the whole system with client certificates. Then you have to check that the whole system is working. How you do that? But you you just can't do that on a on a like a test for the whole platform or something. So what you can do, you can have like different level of tests, which is natural. You you have your component, you have component level testing, you have your public facing functionality you can implement and end-to-end -end testing on top of it. On different environment, like if you have test environment, staging environment, production environment, on testing environment, you might use a dedicated so-called test API to call your uh, microservices directly to simplify automation maybe, to do a batch of tasks in one step. But in your stage environment, which should be more close to production to keep dev and prod parity close to each other. You cannot use it, and you are limited, and you show your automation cycle will be slightly longer. So basically, the client certificates do not make a big difference in testing. So if you were using before, I don't know, HTTP basic authentication, you provided credential, credential war was your secret. Now you provide, you sign the request with private key. Now this is your secret. Hi. Hi. Um, for instance, in regards of the um, tools you're using for uh, automatically catching vulnerable libraries and dependencies on uh, the current technology stack, um, so that works for those that are at the moment known in the system, but uh, in a microservice organized company, I guess the existence of a lot of teams, and they can usually bring up and down new technologies, new microservice every day. Also, those that are not covered already by your monitors. How do you uh, handle this case? Like, um, do you offload the responsibility to the developers uh, to make these checks or some other strategy? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so the first problem diversity of technology. We target that by using uh, two source clear, which works with different and many, many, many languages. So, in all our cases and technologies which we use, like Scala and Node.js, so we can scan with single tool and build a single automation with one tool. So this is the first idea we use. The second, like who's responsible for what with different teams, we have special security team and they receive notification when new development happens. When new development happens, they add repository to the scanning list. So they start scanning even before you wrote some code and even created repository. And as soon as the vulnerability was found, there is a trigger, they go to the dev team or they can analyze on their own like how severe is vulnerability. Should we like shut down our service immediately? Should we just schedule patch or whatever should we do? Hello. Um, I just uh, would like to know how do you address uh, Quite common problem, in my opinion, uh, like leaking secrets to logs. Uh, sometimes, sometimes it happens. Sometimes, like you lock uh, whole requests together with HTTP headers, and some tokens leak to the logs. Uh, do, do you have any specific mechanism to prevent that, to monitor that, or something like that? Like I'm not aware of any methods which would prevent developer from putting your secret or, I don't know, password of your client into logs. So what we can do is raise awareness of your developers. like, And of course, uh, to look on your logs periodically. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, thank you okay, guys. Okay, thanks a lot.